but gave us a ray of hope. So that's the, uh, the modulation. <laughs> but um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Mr. Ken Myers. Uh, he is the host and producer of the Mars Hill Audio Journal, available online these days, I believe, uh, worth the subscription. It's a bi-monthly audio magazine that examines issues in contemporary culture from a framework shaped by Christian conviction. He is the author of the book, All God's Children and Blue Suede Shoes, Christians and Popular Culture. He's also giving another uh, of the Bach lectures tonight, uh, which are certainly worth attending. So if you uh, are available, I encourage you to come to that. But please uh, join me in welcoming Mr. Ken Myers. Thank you. I, uh, <clears throat> so I was walking in here realizing there are a number of highly trained musicians. I was reminded of the old commercial, the guy says, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a trained musician, but I play one at church. It's so like kind of, uh, it's uh, yeah, a privilege to, to be here with you folks. Um, <clears throat> I wasn't sure quite, again, because I, I I, I, I write popular things about music, and a lot of the things I write are very introductory. As I mentioned last night, I've been writing this column for Touchstone for a number of years, and I had been writing a series of just uh, introductions to important books, understanding culture generally. And uh, after my heart attack 10 years ago, and I decided to devote more time to, to music uh, and and uh, uh, an understanding of music within the context of modernity and how modernity had shaped our perception of music. Um, I asked the editors, can I write about sacred choral music every every other month? And they said, yeah. And I've been doing that for, uh, it's astonishing they've allowed me to do that uh, for so long. Because uh, in some ways it's pretty arcane, but uh, I, I, I try not to be technical. I'm actually going to talk about a work today that uh, that I have, I, I wrote a short piece about, but I, I want us to listen to the whole thing. I know it's radical to actually listen to music in a setting like this. But, um, some introductory comments. Uh, the, 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 this cantata was uh, one of Bach's earliest. He was 22 when he wrote this, and he wrote it for a, a funeral of someone who we don't know who it was. Uh, and um, it's an, an astonishing work uh, that uh, displays <coughs> Bach's ability to layer not just musical ideas, but theological ideas. And, that <coughs> and I, I was first really excited about it. Um, because I was so taken by the uh, chorale melody that shows up in the next to the last movement, which I didn't know, I didn't know the melody, uh, didn't know where it was from, what its history was. You have a copy of the music here, and we will sing this at some point. Uh, how many know this tune or text? You. Anybody? I was happy to see how familiar folks were last night with the things I was pre presenting, uh, and I'm. Uh, happy to, I'm also, ha see I can be happy many ways, I'm, I'm happy that <laughs> no one knows this, just <laughs> because I'm introducing it to you. <laughs> uh, I don't know that I've ever been known to be as sanguine, but uh, <laughs> not known for that. Um, this was, I, 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 I had heard it in this cantata and then later I heard it in one of Brahms's motets. And I thought, what is going on? Where is this from? And it turns out that it was Luther's extended commentary and paraphrase of the Nunc Dimittis. And this was sung in the place of the Nunc Dimittis in Vespers uh, frequently. Uh, and it also happens to be, last night I kept making reference to those famous hymnals published in 1524. It was one of the tunes and texts in the, the first Wittenberg hymnal of 1524. Uh, and, as I, I mentioned last night, that that hymnal included uh, melodies for congregational song and counterpoint written by Johann Walter. And this, uh, we're going to listen to a 
two-minute uh, contrapuntal setting of this that Walter included in that first hymn. I want to make a few opening comments, though, about um, counterpoint. And this is actually taken from a piece I wrote years ago on, on Brahms motets, including a, a motet that included the, this tune. Um, Edmund Rubra, uh, underappreciated 20th century English composer, uh, wrote a book on counterpoint. And he, he, he writes in there, the history of Western music is the history of the form compelling power of counterpoint. Uh, as I think John mentioned last night, the term comes from the Latin punctus contra punctum, point against point. But the againstness in counterpoint isn't a matter of stark or arbitrary opposition. We perceive beauty in the artful use of counterpoint because it reveals the ultimately harmonious relatedness at the heart of a creation called forth by a triune God. The contra in counterpoint is a fruitful against involving, as Rubra himself described it, quote, the cross-fertilization of melodic lines, the genes in each combining to form a totally new musical being, close quote. Counterpoint is a feature evident in instrumental as well as vocal music, but its richest early expressions were in liturgical choral works, where the mystery of the one who is three was daily described and enacted. Choral music of the 16th and early 17th centuries has long been recognized as a rich load of contrapuntal wisdom for composers and performers to mine. The intricate textures of the music of this period were still easily understood as earthly expressions of heavenly realities. Contrapuntal complexities could be analyzed and systematized, but the joy that they evoked was evidence that they were more than the sum of their mathematical and oral characteristics. The self-consciously progressive spirit of the 17th and 18th centuries was decidedly more rationalistic and more practical than earlier ages, and increasingly more earthly than heavenly minded. James Gaines, in his book uh, that I strongly recommend, a number of you probably read, An Evening in the Palace of Reason by James Gaines, the story of Bach's encounter with Frederick the Great, and really the pre pre-modern or pre-enlightenment encounter of the enlightenment, uh, uh, the pre-modern pre understanding of music with the enlightenment account. Gaines has observed that by the time Johann Sebastian Bach was achieving new heights and depths of contrapental gloria, glory, quote, the enlightenment critics of counterpoint were renouncing music's allegorical and cosmic nature, its claim to be a manifestation of the divine. To this generation, music was not to be written according to any higher theory or objective than that of sensual oral pleasure, close quote. Boy, I'm glad we don't live in that time. <laughs> <laughs> not surprisingly, the music written by such scoffers has not stood the test of time as Bach has. And the greatest composers of later centuries continued to rely on contrapuntal techniques to deepen their musical expression. In Rubra's judgment, quote, Beethoven, Verdi, Sibelius, Nielsen, or Holst all illustrate in their development the tendency of musical thought as it matures to move always nearer to the pure springs of contrapuntal thinking. Music wants to be counterpoint, he seems to be suggesting. There's a theological explanation for this phenomenon. Um, the conversational dance experience in counterpoint, and I think Luther used that metaphor of describing uh, counterpoint as a dance. In fact, I think I quote him saying that in my talk tonight. The conversational dance experience in counterpoint is an analog of the Trinity. The late Robert Jensen once claimed that, quote, the final word about God is that he is beautiful and that he is beautiful with the kind of beauty that music has. Indeed, he is beautiful with the kind of music that a certain kind of music has. The last word about God is that he is a great fugue of father, son, and spirit. That reminds me a little bit of what David Bentley Hart has written in uh, The Beauty of the Infinite. Uh, Hart argues that counterpoint is an, an echo of the dynamic interpersonal beauty of the Trinity, who's, and we are image bearers of that form of beauty. Uh, and um, 
our, uh, we experience some of that in the order of creation. So counterpoint, counterpart was not, counterpoint was not an invention of the musical Western tradition. It was a discovery of latent features of creation's goodness. It's a feature that can only be understood by participation, either through singing or through active and attentive listening. And the listening has to be what I call Trinitarian listening instead of Unitarian listening. Uh, Rubra writes, quote, a type of listening that accepted a single melodic line as perfect and self-sufficient would not only view the combination of different melodic lines as unnecessary and chaotic, but as a cancellation of the perfection of each. He's describing what I call Unitarian link, uh, listening. Uh, in this case, he writes, listening would tend to separate out mentally the constituent threads in the musical tapestry instead of unifying these threads into an entity as perfect as that of a single line. So the act of hearing as one, a group of two or more musical lines, what I call Trinitarian listening, does take practice and it requires an attentiveness that contemporary habits of musical listening typically discourage. But then again, how many contemporary habits are we really eager to endorse? <laughs> um, so with that, let's, um, let's look at this cantata a little bit. I ch again, I chose this partly because of the single musical line that is present in, in, the, uh, in the chorale melody that Luther wrote. Again, this is one of his original uh, that uh, has no apparent, no evident or no known precedent. Um, but it, it, it lends itself, uh, Bach, wrote, uh, Bach wrote a number of, I, th I think at least two chorale preludes based on this, uh, and a, a number of other uh, composers have written, it, uh, written uh, contrapuntal works based on this. Um, the, uh, Actually, I think it would not be a bad, actually, no, it would be best to, to start, uh, I wanna keep my, an eye on the clock here. Um, start with uh, playing, uh, not, not that, I'm sure you could all sight read this very easily, but um, just so no one's embarrassed. <laughs> Are we ready? Uh, to, we, have, we have audio here. Uh, this is uh, just the, the, the melodic line. Um. Might be s some slight differences from my notation here. Now that's, uh, the translation here is a rough translation of Luther's own text. And, and uh, again, this is his expanded commentary on Simeon's song. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the, just a couple of musical things to, to point out. Uh, starts with an opening ascending fifth, which itself is kind of dramatic, almost a kind of fanfare. But then the melody drops down a whole step and then jumps up another fifth. So we're now within five notes, we're an octave higher than where we started, which already suggests an ascent. Uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's very significant uh, that, that we call that an ascent. We think of that as notes that are higher. Uh, it, it would make sense to call them notes that are faster. The, Something's vibrating faster. There's no actual literal height involved or ascent, but we think of it that way. And we've been made to experience ascending orally uh, so that we can understand something about ascent. Um, and <clears throat> the other thing to note just uh, uh, is on the third uh, staff, 
where the words soft reposing appear. That's a descending line that goes down to the lowest note in the entire uh, work. And composers such as Brahms and others have exploited that natural descent. And uh, there's a, we're going to listen in a second to uh, Brahms's setting of this in one of the motets. Uh, often in performance, that what is just a half note rest after that is really extended. That, and it's, drama it's dramatically quite effective just uh, as a melody. Uh, here, is, um, here is Walter's setting of this that was handed out, uh, or s I guess sold, at the hymnal in, uh, in 1524. Melody in the tenor. Is that fading out? Huh. Was that fading in the file? Was it? Do you know? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what, what what's going on. Um, okay. Let, let's uh, jump ahead to Buxtehude's treatment of it. Uh, and again, by the time Buxtehude is dealing with this, uh, it had already become familiar to. Measure six in the in the in the melodic line. Buxtehude is kind of like Luther. He's expanding on the meaning of the of the phrase. The end of the second staff, and he has all the notes there. That's the soft reposing phrase. Okay, one, uh, one more example, Baroque example, before, uh, and that is one of the, uh, we'll just listen to the beginning of the uh, Bach uh, Chorale Prelude. It's uh, BWV 616. <laughs>
going to fade that out. That's about halfway through. It's a short piece. It doesn't have any contrapuntal pieces. Okay, now a minute, just one minute, uh, Brahms's setting, which is the final movement of a about a 12-minute motet that he wrote that in, that incorporates other um, biblical biblical texts as well, but it's a motet really with a theme of hope in it. And here's his, here's B Brahms channeling Bach, I think. Somewhere. Oh, I faded, I faded it down by mistake, sorry. Can't have fade back up, Ken. Sorry. Lovely. Uh, I haven't told my wife yet, but that should be sung at my funeral, I think. So, <laughs> so if any of you happen to be around. <laughs> Let's sing it together. We'll just sing the first and, se and fourth stanzas um, and uh, harmonize if you can. And here we'll do it. Everybody does it in. Uh, please, please stand. Uh, it's uh, often done in. Uh, I don't know if this is D minor or a Dorian mode, but uh, I haven't, some, some musicologists can help me understand it, but it does start on a D. Mm -hmm. In peace and joy I now in there mm -hmm. and the syncopation is a little surprising okay let's look at the uh, cantata so we have time to listen to the whole thing so we have uh, we'll have to rush through it um, the, you have the text uh, libretto there just a couple things uh, to point out um, it's it's a, a very it's the, the the division between the movements is obvious but it, it feels very very continuous um, starts with a, a sonatina that sets the stage for it. Um, let me get back. It uh, it's scored. The instrumental uh, complement is uh, just continuo, uh, an organ, and uh, two viola da gambas. Oh, it says this, doesn't it? And two uh, recorders. So uh, it has a 
the recorders make it, again, the recorders are typically associated with pastoral scenes, uh, but, but it does feel the, the texture of the sound, uh, the, 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 the woody texture of the recorders and the, uh, the rougher sound of the viola de gambas give it a really, uh, uh, I don't know, somber quality almost. Mm -hmm. Somber and yet playful. <laughs> I don't know if that's a, accurate. Uh, note, and then the the chorus sings this uh, um, sh a short chorus with some uh, counterpoint in it, uh, some uh, imitative counterpoint. And then there's an arioso, which is essentially the voice of a believer, uh, and. Uh, the voice of God, as it were, responds, and I won't give you all, most of these are biblical texts or, uh, or um, chorale texts from various sources that Bach weaves together. Uh, I think the, the bass aria at 2C is from Ecclesiasticus, uh, if I'm not mis mistaken. And then in, measure two, uh, in section 2D, uh, we have uh, the chorus kind of establishing uh, the, the sober reality of death. But that is uh, wonderfully, it's a, it's a dark sound, it's, it's wonderfully alleviated by a very joyous but very simple soprano aria that comes in. Um, uh, th the third section is one that, it, it's where our chorale melody shows up. And one of the things I find really remarkable is that um, Bach here overlays three different accounts of death and life and the hope, uh, the hope that uh, transcends death. First, we have uh, the words of Jesus on the cross, uh, into your hands I commend my spirit, which is from Psalm 22. I, someone to help me out. I think it's 22. But then we have the words of Jesus to the, to the thief, today you will be with me in paradise. And then we have basically the words of Simeon, who is about to die and who sees the hope, not just hope for himself personally, but the hope for Israel and for the world. And then it closes with a, with a very... Uh, with a, a, a chorale tune. I think there are four different chorale tunes and chorale texts used here, but the one I wanted to pay attention to was, was Mit Fried und Freud. Okay, let's, uh, I, I'm gonna not talk, I'm gonna go sit down. So, because <laughs> I don't wanna interrupt the music and uh, we'll see, I think we'll get just, just in time to finish. Uh. <clears throat>
So, remarkable piece. Uh, and uh, I don't, just a couple quick comments. Uh, it was, uh, the, the base aria is actually from, from Isaiah, uh, not from Ecclesiasticus. The, uh, that dark, it is the old covenant, man, you must die, which has the dark, the darkness is uh, made even more dramatic by um, the, the, the da, 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 da. There's a descending diminished fifth, which is a very, it's, yeah, tritone. Uh, the, the, the devil's, what do they call it? The devil's interval? Or, um, and it's the lowest part. And then uh, the, 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 uh, the interaction between that dark expression and then the soprano Yes, come, Lord Jesus, come. Where they're overlapping, and uh, and then of course at the in the last movement, Jesus does get the last word, <laughs> and and the the delightful moment with the, after that final amen with the recorders, uh, it's a, it's an amazing blend of uh, of uh, grief uh, and. And hope and and joy uh, that 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 he connects together. Um, so anyway, uh, thank you. I, I, I if you all th there are uh, there's a really nice uh, score available at the Bach Cantatas website, and I'd be glad to. I, I've got it. I can e uh, email the PDF to you if you want. And I, I find that with works like this, it it pays to not only have repeated listenings, but listenings with a score if you can read music. I think seminaries really should require students to learn to read music. I don't see how you can possibly serve as a pastor without being able to read music. Um, but uh, uh, 